Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about membranes. I'm going to I'm going to then talk about selective permeability, uh, and then I'm going to talk briefly about cells. So a little. How should I do this? I should probably take these and then try to remember them because these boxes do cost 99 cents. I don't want to leave all my chalk here. Uh, so. Yellow's way too well. We'll start with yellow. Why not? So there's this molecule called glycerol. Yes, that's my R. That's really a sad E, and that's a Y. Uh, glycerol is a three-carbon molecule. Hey, that looks pretty good. It's nice and bright. So three carbons, and. Uh, each of these carbons, because carbon is like this, it's going to have four bonds around it, and uh, it's going to have a bunch of hydrogens like that, uh, but it's also going to have uh, hydroxyl groups. <coughs> Glycerol basically is a three hydroxyl group alcohol. And each one of these hydroxyl groups is reactive. And uh, what the body does is it attaches something called fatty acids to uh, the hydroxyl groups. Uh, it attaches them through a what's known as an ester linkage. And so you end up with something that looks like this. Make sure I get this right. These are carbons. And the carbons are all going to have H's around them. And I'm going to draw that over here. So fatty acid looks like this. C double bond O, OH. That's a carboxyl group. And then uh, we've got a bunch of other C's. And it can be quite long. It could be 18, 20, 16, whatever carbons. Uh, each of the carbons has to have four bonds around it. The bonds are going to either be with uh, other carbons or they're going to be with hydrogens. Like, let's be consistent with our colors. So those are hydrogens. Some of them uh, will have double bonds between the hydrogens. That's an unsaturation point. Sorry, between the carbons. Uh, in which case, there's only going to be one hydrogen, not two. Uh, and then if there's, and the, for the N carbon, there's going to be three because you have to have four bonds around the carbon. So this is a, a short fatty acid. Uh, but what happens is these fatty acids get linked up to glycerol by these ester linkages. Uh, and when you have three fatty acids attached to glycerol, it's called a triacylglycerol, or a triglyceride, or a fat. And so the fats that are stored in our adipose cells, in our adipose tissue, are basically glycerol plus three fatty acids. Now the fatty acids can vary in terms of how long they are. They can vary in terms of their degree of unsaturation, so the number of double bonds in them. Uh, the the shorter they are and the more double bonds, the more liquidy they are, uh, the longer they are and the less double bonds, so the more saturated they are, uh, the less liquidy. Uh, if they are less liquidy, they uh, have more stability at higher temperatures. If they're more liquidy, they tend not to freeze at lower temperatures. If you have things that habitually live in cold temperatures, they tend to have uh, unsaturated or polyunsaturated fatty acids making up their fats. Uh, uh, the uh, fats that come out of mammals because we're warm-blooded tend to be saturated fatty acids, saturated fats. Uh, surprisingly, birds, or at least chickens, have a lot of polyunsaturated fats in them, maybe because they're basically reptiles in disguise. Uh, but, uh, but, but they're warm-blooded as well, so it doesn't work perfectly. Also, throwing in there, we've got cholesterol. Cholesterol is actually found in our membranes, and it works as a temperature buffer. It makes sure that at too low temperatures, our membranes don't freeze as readily, and at too high temperatures, our membranes don't blow apart as readily. 
um, because of all the thermal motion. That's cholesterol. But this is this is um, fat. So fats. I'm gonna have to buy my own erasers. So why do we care? <laughs> so the answer is that we have glycerol. Let's make it longer. Uh, and then we've got um, we've got these ester linkages and these fatty acid tails. And uh, that's the fats that we store in our adipose tissues. But it's possible to replace one of the fatty acids with a much more complicated group, which I have no memory of how to draw. But it is a, what is known as a hydrophilic group. So fats are hydrophobic, especially the fatty acid tails of the um, those big long chains of, of carbon are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic literally means water hating. Oil and water don't mix. And the reason why the oil doesn't mix with the water is because the oil, quote unquote, hates the water. It's hydrophobic. It doesn't want to become wet by water, or water doesn't want to wet it. Um, but there are hydrophilic things, which means water loving. And hydrophilic things want to be wet by water. And so hydrophilic things are going to want to interact with water, and hydrophobic things are going to want to get as far away from water as possible. Okay? So what you have, instead of having, here, I'll just draw it like that. <laughs> instead of having a hydrophobic tail, in fact, we'll draw these even longer. You replace one of the fatty acids, this is still glycerol up here, with this other thing that is hydrophilic. And typically, we draw these things looking like clothespins. where this is the hydrophilic group, and these tails are the hydrophobic part. So this part of this molecule does not want to interact with water, wants to get as far away from water as possible. Oil and water don't mix. This part of the molecule wants to interact with water. We have an everyday item that we interact with that does pretty much the same thing and it's called soap or detergents. And what well, these are are molecules that have one end that is hydrophobic, that interacts with greases and oils that are on your uh, clothing, for example. The other end is hydrophilic, it likes to interact with water, and so what happens is that the oils and what have you on your clothing, get this, the dirt, gets dissolved by the, uh, the, the hydrophobic part of the detergents, and then these are able to become emulsified, go into water solution more or less, um, because of the hydrophilic portions. So you're, you're actually familiar with uh, molecules like this. So these are called phospholipids. The phospho part, uh, it comes from phosphate, which is a very hydrophilic compound. It really loves water. Sorry. So, because this part wants to get away from water and this part wants to be with water, these molecules tend to arrange with each other in, in, in ways that allow that to happen. And one of the ways that this happens is something called a micelle, which I'll draw very quickly because we don't really care that much about it. So these are our little... So these actually form balls. So what you have are the hydrophilic parts on the outside interacting with water and the hydrophobic parts getting as far away from water as they possibly can on the inside. So this is a sphere. This is, it's not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. Um, but another thing that these guys can spontaneously form into is something known as a lipid bilayer, which is where we're going with all of this. So a lipid bilayer looks like this.
So again, I have the hydrophilic part. up there on the outside, and in the interior, I've got the hydrophobic part. It's a bilayer. It's two different layers. This side is interacting with water. This side is interacting with water. In the middle, we basically have a hydrophobic region. Okay? And these are sheets. Again, these are not two-dimensional. They continue onward this way, and they continue out of the board and into the board. So what you end up with are these two-dimensional sheets that are called membranes that are based upon lipids. They're called lipid bilayers. Okay? And these things are fluid, which means that the individual fossil lipids are able to move around in the lipid bilayer relative to one another. It's kind of like salad oil. It has the consistency of salad oil. These molecules can move around. So we have actually surrounding all of our cells this two-layer structure called a lipid bilayer, which is our plasma membrane. Now, our plasma membrane and, and, and lipid bilayers generally um, have some specific properties which give rise to something known as selective permeability. Now, selective permeability means that some things can readily cross lipid bilayers. Again, these things are sheets, so they're, they're sealed against themselves. When you have a cell surrounded by a membrane, it's surrounded by a lipid bilayer that doesn't have any holes in it. So something is going to go from outside the cell to inside the cell. It's got to somehow cross this lipid bilayer. It has to cross this interior here. If something is going to go from inside the cell to outside the cell, it's going to cross the lipid bilayer. So what are the properties of the lipid bilayer? Well, it turns out the important part is the interior. The little heads of the closed pins the hydrophilic part, this is the part that interacts with water. And its job is to interact with water. And anything that's approaching the lipid bilayer is already interacting with water. So they don't play much of a role in the selective permeability of a lipid bilayer. However, the interior does, made up of all of these fatty acid tails, these long hydrocarbons, um, plays a very important role in determining what can cross the lipid bilayer. So what do we know about this? We know that this interior is hydrophobic. Hates H2O, water. Okay? There's this concept called like dissolves like. And what it basically means is that hydrophilic things dissolve in hydrophilic things like water, and hydrophobic things dissolve in hydrophobic things such as oil. The kinds of things that can readily cross a lipid bilayer are things that can dissolve in the hydrophobic thing. These are going to be hydrophobic things. Okay? Another thing that has difficulty crossing the lipid bilayer are really big things. So the kinds of things that can readily cross a lipid bilayer have the terrible, terriblest time drawing these arrows. Apparently I need lots of this 99 cent chalk because I break it like crazy. That's supposed to be a big arrow. It's a green arrow too, which is good. It, it's, these are things that are crossing. So what readily crosses, uh, what readily crosses are small hydrophobic things. Okay? A very important small hydrophobic thing that readily crosses a uh, lipid bilayer uh, is oxygen, molecular oxygen, O2. Our, our cells need this because this is what we use as our, what's known as a final electron acceptor uh, used by the, our mitochondria. Uh, when we're making our ATP, which is how the world goes, goes around, at least as far as uh, organisms are concerned. Uh, they need to make ATP. In order to make ATP, they use, at least our cells, use up oxygen. Oxygen just dissolves right across the lipid bilayer. 
Why? Because oxygen looks like this. It's a molecule that basically, it looks the same from either direction. There's no charge or partial charge associated with this molecule, which means it's a hydrophobic molecule. When things have charges or partial charges, they like to dissolve in water. When things don't, uh, they tend to dissolve in hydrophobic solvents. So oxygen easily goes through, and so does carbon dioxide. CO2, CO2 looks like this, and it's actually a linear molecule, so again, it's, it's got the symmetry to it that, as a consequence, uh, it doesn't have any charges, partial charges, full charges, and so it, too, readily moves across membranes. Uh, if this was the inside of a cell and that was the outside of the cell, oxygen would be coming in, by and large, carbon dioxide would be going out, because that's the waste that's given off by our mitochondria. In fact, the movement across this lipid bilayer would be in the direction of oxygen going in and carbon dioxide coming out. But it doesn't happen for any reason that has anything to do with the membrane or the carbon dioxide or the oxygen, but instead has to do with the mitochondria which live inside our cells. Uh, the mitochondria use oxygen, they use it up, which means that as um, oxygen comes in, it gets used up. So there is a dearth of oxygen, these are minus signs, on the inside of the cell, and an excess on the outside. Things tend to move from regions of large amounts of stuff to small amounts of stuff, if, if it's able to move at all. So because there's lots of oxygen on the outside, which is assured by our, our cardiovascular system, uh, in, in combination with our respiratory system, uh, we have lots of oxygen outside our cells, but we're using up the oxygen inside the cells. The oxygen is just diffusing all over the place randomly, uh, but it is randomly diffusing from regions of high concentration to low, and so it comes into our cells. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, it's actively being gotten rid of by our body. Again, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, but carbon dioxide is being generated by our mitochondria. So we have a large amount, instead of plus, plus, or, and minus, 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 it's the opposite. It's plus, plus, plus in, uh, on the inside, and minus, minus, minus on the outside. So it randomly moves out of the, uh, the, uh, out of the cell. And again, it just crosses the lipid bilayer because it can dissolve in the lipids, and it does so because it's these uh, nonpolar molecules. Now, there are many other kinds of things out there that may be small, but they have partial charges or full charges. And these things, in fact, can't cross a lipid bilayer. And if we want something to cross a lipid bilayer and we're lacking, uh, and it doesn't dissolve readily in the hydrophobic region of the membrane, then you need something to facilitate its crossing of the membrane. And for that, we have what are known as transport proteins. That's a, a big blob that's a transport protein. It could be a tube channel. Uh, it could be something that, as I like to put it, grabs something on one side of the membrane and pulls it across and releases it on the other side. So membranes, like the plasma membrane, aren't just lipid bilayers. They're lipid bilayers in combination with proteins. The proteins have a lot of jobs. One of the jobs is the movement of stuff from outside the cell to the inside or, or from the inside to the outside. Now, this stuff that's moved across using these proteins, it can be moving with its concentration gradient. So if there's lots on the outside and not a lot on the inside, it could just flow in using the facilitation of the proteins coming in. Or alternatively, energy can be expended to pump whatever the substance is from a region of low concentration on one side to a region of high concentration on the other side. Just like pumping water uphill requires energy, pumping anything in its concentration gradient requires energy. But this is how we get stuff across membranes that doesn't normally uh, want to or is not normally able to cross membranes. Now in the five minutes I have, I'm going to now segue not really, to talking about cells. So our cells are surrounded by a lipid bilayer. So 
I, I'm not, I guess I could, so that, that's our, our phospholipids and our two layers. I guess we could draw this as a two layer structure, but out of laziness, I'm just drawing it like that. So our cells have two physiological concerns in our bodies. The first concern is that they stay alive, and the second concern is that they contribute to body functioning in some manner. Okay? There's a third thing where they also try to keep from degrading the functionality of the body. So they're also trying not to turn, for example, into cancer cells. But they really have two physiological functions, taking care of themselves and taking care of the body around them. Now, when you're talking about just the functionality of a cell, a cell taking care of itself, uh, you're basically talking about something called cell biology. So when you're talking about mitosis and meiosis, uh, this is sort of cell biology. When you're talking about how membranes work, sort of cell biology, how mitochondria work, that's pretty much cell biology. When you say that a cell has a nucleus, and the nucleus has chromosomes in it, and somewhere in there there's a nucleolus, and there's rough endoplasmic reticulum, maybe smooth, and a Golgi apparatus, I'll just write Golgi, and vesicles, mitochondria are in there. So all that kind of stuff is, is important to the functioning of the cell. And that kind of thing is studied in the guise of cell biology. However, inside our bodies, our cells also function towards the greater good of the body. And when we're studying that functionality, that is something we call physiology, or we study from the perspective of physiology. And many of the same things that the cell uses in order to take care of itself, its cell biology, uh, gets translated into its physiology. Because the cell will be asked to do something, and it will typically use what's going on inside of the cell in order to do that thing, like a muscle contracting. It's all going on inside of the cell. So there's this great overlap between physiology, which again is, is how we're going to be looking at human biology, uh, and the functioning of a cell. But we don't need to think about the functioning of the cell in the same kind of detail. What we're going to be doing is either talking about parts of the cell that have some functionality that we'll go, be going over, such as how a muscle works. Or alternatively, we'll be treating these cells as black boxes. There might be stuff that's diffusing in or being facilitated across membranes, and it causes the cell to change in some way. And then it does something. Maybe it releases something. Or when we're talking about nerve functioning, uh, we're going to be talking about stuff that moves, that's facilitated in its movement across a, a lipid bilayer, uh, and this allows the conduction of a, a nerve impulse uh, down the nerve. I mean, it's all, it's, there's a lot of cell bio biology underlying physiology, uh, but in this class we're not going to concentrate so much on the cell biology, uh, but instead we're going to be talking about things that happen by and large between cells or across the body as a whole. Uh, rather than many, all of the details going on inside the cells. Though, we're certainly going to look in certain cases, such as in terms of muscle contraction, about stuff that actually happens inside the cell. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer the questions. And, and otherwise, I guess I will see you on Monday. And email me if you've got any questions. If there's anything that's not working out for you, let me know.